Hey guys, do a dreamer. Um, last night I was gonna do a full review on WWE Payback, but I felt very tired and I had to go to work in the morning, so I decided not to do that. Plus, um, the way I felt about the pay review itself kind of made me feel like I was watching a glorified version of Raw and SmackDown, only on a bigger scale and stuff like that. So nothing really special happened that really spoke violence to me to want to review the whole show. So what I'm going to do, as usual, like with Raw and stuff, like pick out something that kind of spoke volumes to me and hopes that fans will actually understand what's going on and WWE's mindset. So the one thing I do want to talk about, um, there actually there's three things I want to talk about from the show that really spoke volumes to me. Uh, first is the whole Daniel Bryan surrendering, surrendering the title to Stephen McMahon, and if he doesn't do it, then Brie Bell gets fired. Uh, when I saw that, um, you know, that segment, I thought it was interesting to see them all smiles and stuff, uh, and I thought like, hmm, they're planning something. But then turns out. Brie Bella didn't want to give Stephanie McMahon the satisfaction of firing her, so she decided to quit the company and therefore save Daniel Bryan from surrendering the belt. And then after that, Brie Bella gave her a big, huge slap in the face, and I was hoping for a cat fight from that, but then Stephanie just walked away from it, you know what I mean, which was kind of interesting. But anyway, um, my thoughts on this is... Uh, and I said this on Facebook that it's interesting that WWE is actually buying Daniel Bryan some time to heal his neck because, you know, it, it, I know a lot of people were kind of figuring that, you know, WWE never wanted Daniel Bryan to be on top anyway, so they're going to take this opportunity to actually strip the belt. And they're kind of proving a lot of their fans wrong right now. This is showing that they're buying Daniel Bryan some time and that they still see Daniel Bryan as a good investment to the company. So that is actually a good thing that they're keeping the title on him as much as they can. I don't know how long it'll, they're going to do this or how many excuses, I just grabbed my keys, how many excuses they're going to make to show that Daniel Bryan is not going to be stripped from the title or surrender the title. Maybe they're going with that route, we don't know. Um, but it, like I said, it just shows that WWE does have an interest in Daniel Bryan being the face of the company by doing this tactic. Like we've seen similar tactics like this with Stone Cold Steve Austin when he hurt himself, making him do other things while he was champion when they know that he couldn't physically wrestle for a while. You know what I mean? And they did it the same for um, Kurt Angle. You know what I mean? Even though he wasn't a champion at the time, but they did the same thing for him. So. Like I said, take it what it is, I feel that the WWE is actually still interested in having Daniel Bryan as a huge investment for them. Uh, and maybe it's because they don't want to hear any flack from the fans out there saying, Oh, you just gave him a short title reign and stuff like that, boo. But at the same time, I, I just feel that it does, there's a double-edged sword to this that even though, yes, they are they have interest in making Daniel Bryan that guy. At the same time, it's just making the title kind of seem less important right now because right now it's not being defended. It's being held up by Daniel Bryan and instead of coming up with, like, say, an interim uh, champion to make it still interesting, they decided to just keep it on him. But at the same time, it's also there's also a good side to this. It's giving the IC title and the United States title a little bit of... Uh, exposure finally you know I mean when's the last time we've actually seen both the Intercontinental T Championship and the United States Championship get defended on the same pay-per-view uh, we rarely see this we rarely see some stuff like that so it gives the uh, it get it's given the mid Carters uh, a chance to shine in a way you know what I mean so uh, with that being said, whatever happens, happens and if he does get stripped he gets stripped but I know there are fans out there who are happy I'm trying to look at it from a business sense. So anyway, uh, next thing I want to talk about is Bray Wyatt versus John Cena in the last man standing match. Um, I honestly felt that Bray Wyatt should have won that, but at the same time, I was still satisfied with the match. I It pretty much did what it had to do. Um, they had a feud. The whole point is to get violent and stuff like that to the point they want to make sure that the person does not get up at the count of 10. Um, and I was happy that um, it was actually going to be those two alone, even though it first started with uh, Luke Harper and Eric Rowan 
uh, being on Bray Wyatt's side and then the Usos come out to be on John Cena's side and then they get taken out by dives and stuff like that they get taken out then they let them do their stuff get violent go over the place and it was very physical um, some of the best selling I've seen from John Cena yet especially when he got that um, crushed by Bray Wyatt he started coughing like he had a collapsed lung or something like that so I thought I actually liked that um, and then of course Usos and the, and the Wyatt's come back out to do a table spot uh, both of them go all all four of them goes through tables in different um, situations and stuff like that and I think that moment in that match was when uh, Luke Harper uh, gave uh, one of the Usos a superplex through two tables to the outside so that was actually awesome and then the finish um, like I said I was you know I kind of hoped that Bray Wyatt was going to win this but I was still satisfied with the finish of the FU or I mean attitude adjustment excuse me attitude adjustment uh, into one of the sound equipment boxes and then John Cena to make sure he doesn't get up and then John Cena wanted to make sure that Bray Wyatt doesn't get up put a heavy box on top of that box and then stand over it and make sure he stays down for the count of 10. Now I know a lot of fans out there are going to be feeling like oh John Cena just buried uh, Bray Wyatt. No he didn't. The fact that John Cena had to use a heavy box to keep Bray Wyatt down still shows how dangerous Bray Wyatt is because we all know what Bray Wyatt he was gonna get up no matter what no matter what kind of pain he was gonna go he was still gonna get up no matter what and John Cena knew that character wise John Cena knew this and used a heavy box and pretty much bury him with the box and make sure he doesn't get up so in a way, it wasn't really making Bray Wyatt look weak. And I know a lot of fans out there are going to be saying, yeah, it did make him look weak. But look at the little things. The little things, you know what I mean? And those are the things that people tend to overlook. And they always want to go for the jugular. Oh, John Cena just buried uh, um, Bray Wyatt. Bray Wyatt's going to have a, a shitty career now. And like I said, I doubt that Bray Wyatt is still having a promising career. He's not going to get buried. And the fact, like I said, that John Cena had to use a heavy box to keep him down just shows that, you know, how dangerous Bray Wyatt is when he's not having anything on top of him. So think of that, people, okay, before you start going on Cena sucks and Cena's a politician and whatnot, all right? And the last thing, speaking of politicians, and the, and the last thing I want to talk about is the main event uh, between Evolution and The Shield. Uh, where it was very, very physical. It was very physical. Um, I loved every moment. I thought that was match of the night. It was um elimination, no holes barred match. I thought that was match of the night, hands down. Um, <laughs> They, uh, the Shield took a huge amount of punishment there. You're seeing um, high definition TVs going through Seth Rollins. You're seeing um, DDTs on the on the stage <laughs> to um, Dean Ambrose, and then also you see uh, Roman Reigns taking the punishment of his lifetime, um, taking those kendo sticks to the back, and I have to give him respect. I give all of them respect. But the thing is, I know that people were thinking at the first that, oh, Triple H is going to bury these guys, they're going to win. But turns out that the Shield won on a clean sweep. They pretty much eliminated one by one by one by one. Clearly shows that uh, Triple H has high hopes for these guys and he was willing to put those guys over at his own expense. So that's something you guys need to actually think about. And then also let's talk about Batista. You know how people are always thinking like, oh, he was getting in the boss's ear so he can get into Royal Rumble and then into WrestleMania and stuff like that. And what we just saw is like three times in a row for every pay-per-view, he took the loss. You ever notice that? WrestleMania 31, he tapped out to Daniel Bryan which made Daniel Bryan made, made Daniel Bryan the WWE Heavyweight Champion. Then at Extreme Rules, he lost the whole match by getting pinned by Roman Reigns. And then in this one, he was the first to be eliminated. So that clearly shows that this guy was a businessman and he didn't mind putting people over. So I'm hoping after seeing this that we cut Batista a little bit of slack. 
Okay, because I know that people are still pissed off with the fact that oh he took Daniel Bryan's spot That should have been Daniel Bryan's spot and stuff like that. Shut up. You guys were actually happy when he came back and now What we just saw is pretty much evident that He does know how to do business You know he didn't let the whole I'm a superstar I'm gonna be a movie star go to his head like some wrestling thing like some wrestlers do you know so consider that and, 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 and consider the fact that what Triple H has just did for two, uh, three very young uh, promising talent that he actually put these guys over very, very strong. I mean, what more do you want people? You know what I mean? Is he bearing anybody anymore? To me, he, what does he have to gain in bearing anybody? I mean, he's already in the position of power. You know what I mean? And now I know I'm not talking about being on top of Stephanie McMahon, but he's already in a position of power where he, he doesn't really need the spotlight anymore. And the only time he's actually in the spotlight is to try to put certain guys over right now. So, in a way, I guess you can say that Triple H finally knew his place. So, anyway, what do you guys think? Uh, do you think that those three things I was talking about make sense? Do you still feel that the pay-per-view could have been a lot better and stuff like that? And I know I didn't do a full review, but like I said, it really made me feel like a glorified Raw, a glorified SmackDown to just make me want to talk about the more important things of that uh, pay-per-view. So, um, like I said, if you agree or disagree, leave a comment down below. Tell me what you guys think, and we'll see what goes from there. Alright guys, take care.